Hello YouTube, uh, welcome to the first uh, victim lock here on Locked Out. Um, these are the tools that I introduced you guys to in the uh, introductory video there. Um, this lock I showed you once or twice in that video and uh, as promised we're going to go ahead and try to give this thing a a good pick today. Uh, let's see here if I can get this to, you know, work. That, that would be nice. Okay, here we go. I don't like autofocus because it just sucks. But uh, anyway, this is a Master 140 with probably the most radical bidding on YouTube. I've I've seen a few other uh, few other folks pick these locks, um, but I haven't seen a one um, that has this radical bidding. One or two of them actually show the key, and uh, this is like a, I, I have no idea what this bidding is, but let's say it's yeah, I mean it looks like an eight four eight four or something like that. It's it's really um, extreme, <laughs> and uh, of course. The lock does work. And what we're going to do today is try to manipulate this lock open. Now, a word about picks. Um, I made this pick. I, I made the other one you see, too. I made all the tools that I use uh, on, on this type of thing right here. Um, I made this out of a bobby pin. And I shaved off where I sanded off most of the uh, coating in this direction out to the tip. Um, I took um, a pair of dikes right here. I took a pair of dikes and uh, a pair of ice grips and I uh, chalked this thing up and I bent it the difficult direction, you know, rather than the uh, rather than the easy way to make the hook kind of curve up so we can get around stubborn pins. I had this lock in, I had this particular lock in mind when I made this pick. This is the first pick I ever made and this is my first pick, this lock. Um, on camera here will be the second time I've ever actually manipulated this lock open. Got it the first time earlier today. But uh, anyway, this uh, tool has a problem. And it's a it's a pretty major problem. Okay, so let's say we're going in from the keyway, which we should be. Let's say we're going in from the keyway, and we're going around metal. Remember, so now I'm in the bottom of the keyway, and here's pin one. Okay, I can get around pin one because of the amount of room I have with the pick. I can get around pin one and get to be able to set pin 2. And pin 3, of course, is no problem. But when it comes to pin 4, I'm going to be screwing up pin 3 if I raise pin 4 any higher than that. Which means I'm never going to be able to set pin 4 with this pick. So I had to say, screw that pick. And I had to make another one. And I figured while I'm making another one, I might as well make it fancy, you know, fancy, right. Um, <laughs> I might as well uh, give it a handle and all that good stuff because I, I, I figured I'm going to be spending a lot of time with this tool so I might as well make it as comfortable as I can. Um, another thing I did with this is when I made the, the hook for this one I actually bent it twice. First I bent this part and then I bent this part and uh, or actually the other way around. I bent this one and then I bent this one. Uh, I, to give it this little extra, you know, jut, because now we stick it in to the lock, and it can get pin one, it can get pin two, it can get pin three, and just from the bottom, it can get pin four. It can set pin four, and it's just sharp enough to set pin four and leave uh, pin three alone. So this particular pick was made for this particular lock. <laughs> um, 
which I think is probably kind of cheating. In my way, it's cheating. Not really, but it kind of is. Anyway, um, another thing is cheating is getting to discover my own good ways of making good uh, tension wrenches because um, it's a good thing that this accidentally curved on me when I was cutting it. Uh, just the action of being cut out caused it to curve like this and uh, it's pretty good because if this was going straight out this would not be very comfortable I wouldn't be able to get you know I wouldn't be able to feel very well what I was doing but now I can hold this all sorts of different ways and uh, you know I can feel pretty well what it's doing um, and it's not too damn long which would be a problem most of the time and it's not too long in the keyway either it just hooks barely on the inside of the keyway that way it's not putting a bunch of metal in the keyway that doesn't need to be there um, so we're just gonna go ahead and go straight into it and we're gonna try and get this done gotta redo my zoom here so I can hold this a little lower and uh, keep it comfortable and try to give you a pretty good idea of what's going on. Okay, this lock has a funny progression. I have to, I have to do a bunch of random crap, or not really random, but I have to do a funny set of things. The way this bidding is, and which pin is the security pin, means that you know I've I pretty much have no choice but to set the same pin multiple times and uh, that can really be a kind of you know a pain in the ass <clears throat> so I figure while I'm doing this I'll, I'll regale you with some tales of uh, you know information about this stuff of course I need to shout out to Bosnian Bill once again for setting me on the path here. He gave me some excellent advice about this lock, namely don't let this be your first lock. It's going to be a pain in the ass and of course he was right. <laughs> I wouldn't expect anything else and uh, of course I decided to throw caution to the wind and climb on the horse backwards and well that, that, that works out for me historically. Anyway you'll notice I'm not using a lock stand it's not because I can't afford to fashion one or something else like that I, I could I've got lots of stuff around here I could use but uh, I figure for the for the for the purpose of making a video yeah the lock stand might be good but for the purpose of actually practicing see I'm trying to get how I practice on film or film. <laughs> I'm trying to get how I practice on camera. I'm not really interested in using a lock stand because if I ever have to actually do this in the field, uh, I'm not going to have the luxury of a lock stand. More than likely, whatever I'm working on is going to be mounted in something and I'm not going to have the option of, you know, putting it how I want it and working with it or doing you do it basically taking every step I can to make it as easy as possible to pick you know uh, aside from maybe moving a chain around or something but uh, I have uh, I have discovered through my experience of of other dealings with locks because I, I this, this is you know this is the first time in my life I've ever actually invested any time learning how to manipulate locks usually the only encounters with locks I would have is in uh, well breaching them destructively or otherwise basically just uh, invalidating them. I, I devoted an entire science like study to figuring out you know what locks are most likely to be left unlocked by authorized users and I, you know I targeted things I'm, I'm an ex-con and when I say ex-con pretty far X. I'm 10 years out now and uh, you know, I've gone totally legit and this and that. And I don't break the law anymore except for 
you know, stuff that really has no business being illegal. Um, but I'm not uh, going to talk about that at the moment. Um, the only reason I bring it up is because Bosnian Bill and several others make the point that most criminals are not going to learn how to do this, and I have to agree. I did a lot of you know I did a lot of time in prison, and um, most of the people in there who were in there for you know uh, uh, property crimes, theft, vandalism, whatever not. Actually, I don't think there was anybody in there for vandalism, but there were a lot of people in there for theft. And uh, people steal all kinds of things, you'd be amazed. And what they won't do, though, is waste time picking locks or learning how to pick locks. There's actually people in the penitentiary who are lacking so much education, they believe that it's a complete myth that you can pick a lock with you know, say, bobby pins or whatever not. They actually believe that that is all Hollywood junk. And while most of lock picking displayed on TV is tantamount to junk because of, you know, the little purposeful mistakes they throw in <clears throat> so that they don't, you know, create an instructable for picking locks, which is exactly what I'm doing, and I'm not exactly sure why that would be a bad idea because like I was saying, most criminals don't bother doing any kind of research. That's why they're criminals. They're too lazy to do what they're going to do um, legitimately. Because I don't care what it is that you want to do in life. I don't care how far out or extreme or perverted or whatever it is. There's somewhere on earth that it's legal. There's some circumstance under which doing what you want to do would be legal or at least you wouldn't suffer any consequences for doing it. I, mean, I don't care what it is. If you want to kill people for a living, join your country's army, you know, whatever country you're in, if you like the idea of killing people. Uh, you'll, you'll be given a job where, where eventually you'll be permitted to do that. Become a police officer if you want to do things, pretty much anything at all, short of killing somebody. Um, and, and have it pretty much be swept under the rug and, you know, buddy, buddy, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We're going to pretend that didn't happen. Don't worry about that. Um, if you, if you want to get away with being a criminal, be a cop because you'll get away with it a lot. <laughs> I'm not saying that cops are all criminals. I'm saying that the criminals who don't get caught the most often are wearing badges and that's why they don't get caught. Um, international international laws on lock picking tools, these these instruments here that you know like I said in the first video I made out of common household items. Um, these tools, I'm lucky I'm in America um, because in some places these tools are actually illegal. For instance, in Poland, you can only possess these if you're an actual locksmith. If you're not a locksmith, you're not allowed to possess this stuff. In Hungary, believe this or not, uh, lock picking tools are totally illegal for anyone to possess, even locksmiths. The only people who can possess them are members of the military. Um, because lock lock picking tools are classified as military equipment uh, in Hungary. One of the few uh, European Union countries that has any kind of laws at all about lock picks and I th think it's kind of interesting that how much of their population is like in desperate poverty uh, so that I guess there would be a lot of incentive for you know learning about lock manipulation for those folks. They're not even allowed to have stuff. Can you imagine the kind of problem it would be for a woman to have bobby pins in her hair in Hungary because that's what this is made out of. It's made out of a bobby pin. So, you know, if you're if you're in India and you're walking down the street and somebody just wants to make a problem for you and they happen to be wearing a uniform, 
If you have bobby pins in your hair, you're in possession of lock picking tools, theoretically. I'm not sure what kind of protect. I'm not first at all on Hungarian law, so I have no idea what kind of protections there would be in place uh, against you know frivolous charges of that of that kind. Um, <clears throat> in the UK, which is uh, generally known as Great Great Britain, but it, it includes a few other places too. In the UK, mere possession of lock picking tools automatically presumes your intent to use them for a crime. Um, in other words, if you're just walking down the street <laughs> and uh, a bobby walks by you and notices somewhere on you that you have lock picking tools or something that he thinks is lock picking tools, right there he has the authority to arrest you and charge you with a crime because you're in possession of lock picking tools. It's not necessary that they that they prove you had any kind of criminal intent. The fact that you have the tools alone is proof that you had the intent to use them for criminal purposes. <laughs> God, I'm glad I live in America. In Japan, you can go to prison for a year or be fined 500,000 yen, which is about 4,200 bucks right now, um, for for having what I've got in my hand right here. Um, <clears throat> But but let me tell you, you know, the the criminal use of lock manipulation tools is is really rather unlikely, unless you've got a very sophisticated criminal who's gone to the effort of educating themselves and maybe is working for somebody who's paying them quite a bit of money. Because your your average thief is not going to go out and go outside your Buick and you know kneel down next to the door and and be doing this for you know five or ten minutes until they get your uh, door open and of course it, you wouldn't have to do that it just takes a wedge and a you know blood pressure cuff and coat hanger pretty much and you can get the door unlocked to your Buick <laughs> which is you know back from my criminal days that's always what I used to concentrate on I I always looked at locks as something to be bypassed something to be um, defeated usually not in a permanent way. Uh, I came up with some pretty ingenious ways, I think ingenious ways, of, you know, defeating locks for the purpose of, of getting past them at certain at certain times. I would do everything from uh, uh, switch out the, uh, the, the strike plate for a door latch I would do everything from switch that out to where the door latch no longer fit inside the, um, the little square there. So even if they lock the knob, you just push the door open. And I would put a little ridge in there so that, you know, even though the, the catch didn't go inside the, the latch didn't go inside the hole, um, it wouldn't, the, the door wouldn't just pop back open either because there was a little ridge that was ground into the, the strike plate. Um, that uh that stopped that tongue from from sliding on it and allowing the door to open. Um, I did a few things to to get around locks. I remember there was this uh about an eight hundred dollar push button uh, medico lock that was on the door of of one place that you know I I went into quite a bit and. Before you get to thinking I'm, you know, just a totally evil person, uh, these buildings were not occupied by people. They were classified as dwellings, but they were completely closed down, and and I mean they weren't being used anyway. Um, there was uh, a push button medico lock on one of these doors at, at ground level, and they replaced that lock because, well somebody had been going in there and relieving them of various and sundry articles and uh, so they decided to you know spend like 600 bucks on this lock and it was one of the push button kinds you know with with you know one two three four five six and you push in the correct combination and the the door lock opens <sighs> unfortunately I never 
really had to know the combination or even guess at it or fiddle with that or anything because it was too much of a pain in the ass for them to use you know they might have these might be construction you know workers uh, who have armloads of crap that they're going in and out with and and it's a pain in the ass to sit there and punch a combination in every single time you've got to go through that door uh, so they just of course they just blocked it open with a, a piece of concrete and well, of course, you know, what always eventually happens there is the last person goes home for the day. And they totally forget about that. They, they, <laughs> they leave the scene with the door propped open. And that's, well, that's how I beat that particular lock. So it doesn't really matter how good your lock is. If you've got users who are the most prevalent weak point in any security uh, in any kind of security structure at all, the weak point is always the users. Even when the system is designed, at least partially, uh, to keep them secure and is implemented for that purpose, um, they will defeat it out of laziness, out of you know lack of understanding that really that lock is there because of the one time that it'll dissuade someone from you know, doing something they shouldn't. <clears throat> that lock is not there for everyday protection. That lock is there to protect against the one time it might happen. The trouble is, you never know when that one time is going to be. People just kind of tend to dismiss that particular fact. See, I keep setting this first pin in case you wonder why the fuck this is taking me so long. Aside from the fact that I'm an idiot. Okay? This first pin takes for fucking ever to set. When it finally does, of course it, it's set because there the bottom part is just moving around freely. There's no spring behind it. So the top part is is locked out of the thing here. God. And there we go. Second time in life. Picking any lock, picking this lock, got it on camera, finally.